let us start with the peace chant om bhadram karne bhi shrunuyam deva bhadram pashe maksha bhirya jatra sthirai rangai stushtu vagam shastanu bhi vyashe ma deva hitai yadayu Swastina Indro Vridhashrava Swastina Pusha Vishwaveda Swastina Starksho Arishtanemi Swastino Brihaspatir Dadhatu Om Shanti 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 the twelfth mantra. We were doing the twelfth mantra. So please repeat after me. <coughs> Amatra Shatutta Amatra Shatutta Abhyavahadya Abhyavahadya Prapancho Pashama Shivo Advaita Evam Onkaram Atmeva Samvishati Atmana Atmanam Ya Evam Veda The Om is the fourth. The ultimate, the ultimate reality, the self itself. It is the amatra, the, the silence after the three letters, a, u, and m. It's the silence beyond the three letters. It is the, uh, it is beyond all transaction, beyond all use. It is the, the cessation of the universe. It is the auspicious beyond all sorrow. It is, it is non-dual. Thus is Omkar, the self itself, your real self. The one who knows thus merges with the real self or some Vishati Atman Atmanam would be realizes the self by the self. So this is the twelfth mantra. Um, today at the end of the class, since we are concluding the first chapter and also the Upanishad itself and the first chapter of the Mandukya Karika, we shall use a, um, a piece of classical music, come, come, where, which it is sung by uh, Pandit Jasraj. Yes, one of uh, India's greatest classical uh, singers, Hindustani classical music singers, Pandit Jasraj. He has sung the Mandukya Upanishad. So, and uh, not the Karikas, just the Upanishad itself. So, we shall use that uh, for a little bit of meditation. So, classical music and Upanishad also at the same time. Now, the, f- f- um, the twelfth mantra deals with the conclusion of the Upanishad. This, as you remember, it is the smallest of the Upanishads. And uh, the Upanishad has two parts mainly. One part deals with the Enquiry into the self, into what we are. And the other part deals with a meditation on Om, using Om, which is helpful to realize what has been taught in the first part. The meditation on Om is helpful. It's an aid, a support to understand what has been taught in the first part. What is the meditation on Om? We were told that Om has four matras, means letters, but actually three letters, a, U and M, closely approximated by the English A, U and M. And beyond that, the fourth one is silence. The silence into, into which Om um, di- merges, disappears. So four, A, U, M and silence. Corresponding to the four aspects of the self which we had talked about earlier. Your, the waker and the waking universe, the dreamer and the dr- your dream universe, And the deep sleeper and the merged causal universe of the deep sleeper. Beyond that, the one pure consciousness which actually appears 
and is experienced as these three, waking, dreaming and deep sleep. Now can you map them? The Upanishad taught us that you map them in this way. Match a, a to the waker, u to the dreamer and m mm to the deep sleeper. And in this way, when you, when, you do the, when you go through this exercise, what you get is, ultimately, the silence will correspond to the, well, the silence will correspond to pure consciousness. How does that work? It's like this. Here's the key to understanding the 12th mantra. The 12th mantra comes to the, this, this part. How you match the silence with pure consciousness. It works this way. The, the key to understanding this is like this. Words are connected to the objects they reveal. Each word corresponds to an object. The word book, for example, corresponds to this object. The word light corresponds to that object. So words correspond to objects. Each word corresponds to an object. Now in the same way what has been done here is, we have been taught to, to associate the letter A with the waker and the waking world. The entire waking world, whatever you have, and you the waker, all of this we have associated with the letter A, as if the letter A is the name of this, is the word for this, let's say. Now, to understand how this works, go back to the example of the gold and the ornaments. Three ornaments, we take three ornaments, a necklace and a bracelet and a ring and gold. And we note that it is gold alone which appears as a ne necklace, a bracelet and a ring. The essence of the necklace is gold. Essence means the substance. The reality of the necklace is gold. The reality of the ring is gold. The reality of the bracelet is, is the same gold. So gold alone. Gold is the reality. Come. Now, when we examine these ornaments with respect to gold, we realize that these ornaments are not a second entity apart from the gold. This is very important. The ornament does not exist, exist does not exist in what sense? Apart from the gold. So you cannot, when you say gold and you use the word necklace, you use the two words, gold and necklace, you are not actually referring to two things. Remember, words refer to things. So each word refers to a thing. But now you have two words which refer to the same thing. The same golden or, uh, necklace. You have two words, gold and necklace. What does gold refer to? That thing. What does necklace refer to? That very thing. But which is the thing which refers to the substance itself, to the reality itself? The word gold refers to the reality. Necklace does not refer to any specific thing. This is something we must understand. This is the crucial concept. At least intellectually one must grasp that necklace does not ref refer, the word necklace does not refer to any substantial thing. You say, Swami, then what is it that you are wearing? When you wear a necklace, what are you wearing? What? When you ask what? The substance is gold. Necklace refers to the gold with a particular name and form and, and, and a use. So, necklace does not refer to a thing. Now, when you see that the gold is the substance and the ornament is not a substance, then the word for that ornament does not correspond to anything. It does not correspond to any reality. Yeah. Do you follow what I'm saying? This is the secret. If you, if you grasp this, you have grasped grasp the meaning of this uh, mantra. If you do not grasp this, the whole thing will appear mystifying. The word gold refers to a substance. 
the word necklace does not refer to a substance when when gold is in the play when you have got the word word gold which you are using when you are looking at the substance gold then what does the word necklace refer to nothing it does not refer to anything it does not refer to any real entity are you with me on this yes not all of you are on the same page yes yes and at this point someone might say i don't know what you're talking about i prefer my necklace <laughs> and we'll say that all right those who get it they'll say give, give me the gold <laughs> yes it represents itself gold it represents the gold itself yes. um, the necklace does not represent anything else other than the gold yes uh, so the name and the form is not considered to be a thing not considered to be a thing in itself apart from the substance Abs- apart from the 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 material practically when you look at it and make a thought experiment take the um, take the gold away the where is the uh, necklace you might say that it refers to a name and a form and a use but if you take the gold away where is the name and where is the form and where is the use none of them will stay without the gold right you must viscerally feel this therefore without the reality without the substance the name um g- necklace or bracelet or ring does not refer to anything there is no reality left in the necklace without the gold now this that the that the ornament that the ornament is not real apart from the substance the gold this is in sanskrit there's a term for this it's called padartha nisheda the negation of the object negation of the object what is the negation of the object the object remains as it is it's not that the necklace is going to disappear but you realize by clear thinking by analysis that um the that the object is nothing apart from its substance uh, from it from, from its constituent substance from its constituent reality it's simple enough simple enough concept but this is called negation of the substance and with which which what it means is that the ornaments the necklace the bracelet all these ornaments the ring none of these ornaments all these ornaments are negated with respect to the substance gold when the ornaments are negated the names no longer stand for anything necklace does not stand for anything a uh, bracelet does not stand for anything ring does not stand for, stand for anything if it stands for some, something point it out you cannot point it out apart from the gold so it does not stand for anything if it does not stand for anything then the names are also negated in sanskrit the technical term for this is pada nisheda pada means word and padartha means object so the pada the word is book and the padartha object is this the in in the philosophy of language recently this distinction um, it's, there's a famous incident of the professor wittgenstein the great philosopher in the 20th century in teaching in where did he teach in cambridge at or oxford cambridge he taught in cambridge i think yes in uh, in in cambridge in a class he was writing with a piece of chalk and he sh- showed this what is this and he was talking about the word and the object pada padartha he showed the chalk and he asked what is this and the per- and st- one of the students said why professor it's a piece of chalk it's a chalk and he threw the chalk and he hit that guy and he said chalk is a word that thing which hit you is that a word the, the word and the object are two different things the object is negated come the object is negated when you realize that it is nothing apart from the constituents material the substance the word is negated when there is no object corresponding to the word so the words like um that like uh, the moment the the ornaments are negated realizing that they are not, nothing other than gold then the words necklace bracelet and ring are also negated so in sanskrit object negation is called padartha nisheda and word negation is called pada nisheda pada padartha nisheda when the objects are negated hmm, the words also are negated 
Object negation means they do not refer to any specific thing. You cannot point out a thing apart from the constituent substance. And word negation means the word does not refer to anything. The word gold refers to the reality. But what does the word necklace refer to? What does the word ornament refer to? What does the word, what does the word uh, uh, bracelet refer to or the ring? So this is clear. In the same way now, when you look at this, this is, this is how you apply the, all of this was an example. Um, gold and ornament and all of that was an example for this. A is the name of the waker and the entire waking universe. U is the name, the word used for the dreamer and entire dream universe. M, the letter M or in English M is the letter used, is the name used for the deep sleeper and entire, the causal universe, the deep sleep universe. But, now let's go back to the first analysis which we did. Come, come. Let's go back to the first analysis which we did. That uh, it is one consciousness which alone which appears as the waker in the waker's world. It is that same consciousness, the Turiyam, which appears as the dreamer in the dreamer's world. It is the same consciousness which appears as the deep sleeper in the deep sleeper's causal universe. In that case, the waker in the waking world, the dreamer in the dream world and the deep sleeper in the deep sleep world are nothing apart from the Turiyam. This is what we realized in the first part of the Upanishad. You say, when did we do that? Go back to the early, earlier classes. Yeah. You are that consciousness which appears in these three pairs. Hence, these three pairs, these three universes and their knowers are not apart from them. Uh, so this is the Padartha Nisheda, the negation of the object. Hence, the names also do not refer to anything. As the waker and the waker's universe is nothing apart from pure consciousness, then what does A refer to? Nothing. 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 So, as the waker and the waker's world are seen to be nothing other than pure consciousness, as appearances, names and forms in pure consciousness, so the word A has no reference left, it merges into silence. The silence here. As the dreamer and the dreamer's world are seen to be nothing but names and forms in pure consciousness, substantially nothing but consciousness, then the letter U, the name U, also merges into silence because it doesn't refer to anything. As the deep sleeper and the deep sleep universe are recognized to be nothing other than pure consciousness, then the letter M, which is the name of this state, also merges into Silence. Why does it merge into silence? Why does a, uh, u and m merge into silence? Because they do not refer to anything. What is the object corresponding to them? Nothing. This is called padanisheda, negation of the name or the word. Negation of the word, negation of the object. Just as the entirety of the experienced, the three pairs, are nothing other than pure consciousness, and this is understood. Just as the necklace remains as the necklace when it is understood to be gold, your waking world remains as the waking world when it is understood to be pure consciousness. It appears to be the same and it works, everything works as it is, but you realize it is pure consciousness. Then what happens? You remain as pure consciousness and it is referred to by the silence. Why by the silence? Because the other three sounds, a, uh, u and m, mm, the names, they have all merged into silence. Why? Because they do not refer to anything. What is the thing that they refer to? So this is the basic logic behind the 12th mantra. Now if you look at the 12th mantra, if we, I explained it in maybe too much detail, the simple idea behind it is, words refer to objects. If the word does not refer to an object, then the word, word is meaningless. Objects do not exist apart from their constituent substance. So the object has no existence apart from pure consciousness, just like ornament has no existence apart from gold. Hence, these names do not refer to anything substantial. They merge into silence. Yes. 
Now let us look at the twelfth mantra. We did a little bit of this last time, I think. Amatra. Matra means the letter. So properly speaking, Om has three matras, three letters. A, U and Ma. The silence is not properly speaking a letter. That's why it's called Amatra. Not matra, not letter, but it refers to silence. Amatra Chaturthaha. It is the fourth. Exactly like pure consciousness is the fourth aspect. But really we know pure consciousness is not the fourth aspect. It's the only one aspect which appears as the three aspects. These three aspects are like the ornaments. They are, if I, even if I don't say illusory, they are experiential. But the stuff of that experience, the substance of that experience, the reality of that experience is the consciousness which you are. You alone experience yourself. In the waking state as this. You alone, the Turiyam, you experience yourself as this in the dream state. You alone experience yourself as the deep sleeper in the deep sleep state. But all through, just like the gold in each of the ornaments, you are just this pure consciousness. So this silence refers to the pure consciousness. Fourth, just as this is the fourth, here also the silence is the fourth. Amatras Chaturtha, the silence at the end of Om is the fourth. Remember, however, this is another important thing to remember. This silence is not the absence of noise. I mean, I'm speaking and uh, there, is, there is sound. If I don't speak, if I don't speak, it's an absence of noise. The Amatra is not an absence. In that case, the self will become nothing. Mm. Shunyam, the void. No, what this silence refers to is the pure consciousness. How does silence refer to pure consciousness? When the all sounds fade away into silence, that silence, you remain as the witness to that silence. You remain, that consciousness remains as the witness to that silence. So basically this silence is silence consciousness. Consciousness as the witness to the silence. So silence does not refer to a physical silence, the opposite of noise. And then this silence can be cancelled by noise and also it's basically, there are two problems. If you just think silence means no noise, that's all. It doesn't mean that. Because there are two problems with that. One problem is, if there is noise, uh, ooh, mm, that means the silence is gone. That's one problem. And the second problem is, simply silence, the absence of noise is an absence, it's nothing. It's not a positive something. And the self in that case will be a void, nothingness. Rather, the silence is consciousness itself. The silence represents consciousness, the witness consciousness which experiences silence. The silence itself is known by consciousness. If you chant Om, Om, the A, uh, U and M, mm, appear to you the consciousness and the silence after that also appears to you the consciousness. Right? Okay. I hope you won't fall down again. Mm. All right. All right then. The silence is the fourth it, and Pure consciousness is the witness to that silence. The silence, what I mean is, silence means this pure consciousness. It does not mean absence of noise. And therefore that silence continues even when a, uh, u and m mm are there. Behind them, in the background of a, uh, u and m, mm, that silence is there. That witness consciousness silence is there. Now about this fourth Certain terms are used. You will see they are exactly the same terms used in the seventh mantra, which were used for Turiyam. In the seventh mantra, which talked about Turiyam, do you remember? Nanta pragyam na bhish pragyam na vayata pragyam na pragyana ghanam na pragyam na pragyam. Like that one, that seventh mantra. Similar terms are used. Exactly same terms are used here. Abhyavahadhyaha, non-transactional. Speech all of these are transaction. When you speak, it is transactional. Transaction means use, right? When you are using sounds, you are using it. But the silence is non-transactional. I give you the example. 
If you have a person speaking in Spanish, if you have a person speaking in Chinese, another person speaking in Hindi, it all sounds different. Right? You can hear it. You can see the difference. You can hear the difference. <laughs> but suppose they keep silent. The Chinese speaker, the Hindi speaker and the Spanish speaker. Is the Spanish silence and the Chinese silence and the Hindi silence, can you distinguish between them? No, you cannot. It is non-transactional. Abhyavaharim. Silence cannot be transactional. You cannot distinguish. Then, prapanchopashamaha. So, silence corresponds to this pure consciousness where the three universes are not there. Prapancha means universe. The causal universe, the dream universe and the physical gross universe are not there in Turiyam, pure consciousness. Similarly, in the silence, no words are there. So, prapanchopashama means the silence of all languages, basically. Um, basically, the absence of dictionaries. That's what it means. Prapanchopashama, silence of the universe here, silence of language. Shiva, auspicious. It is in um, the seventh mantra, it meant that the sturiyam is beyond suffering, beyond all trouble. And that is true. Silence is golden. You know, it's beyond all trouble. It's speaking which gets us into trouble. So silence. <laughs> silence generally does not get us into trouble. So silence is golden. Advaita, non-dual, non-dual. All of these three are not different from this witness consciousness silence. They arise from it, they do not exist differently from it, and they appear different, but they all merge back into it again. See, note that just as these are not different from that pure consciousness, these words also, when they have nothing to refer to, they merge back into silence. So the silence is non-dual with respect to a, u, and m. Evam omkara atmeva. In this way, om, the holy or sacred syllable, a word om, is the self. How is this om self? Here, om means the silence beyond a, u, and m. So this silence is the self. This is what it means. Which self? The pure consciousness which you are. Evam Omkara Atmeva. The one who realizes this, realizes what? Who realizes Om, the implied meaning of Om, the, the final meaning of Om, what it culminates in, that witness consciousness silence. One who realizes Om in, in this way, Samvishati Atmana Atmanam, merges into the real self by the real self. Realizes consciousness by consciousness. Um, in the Gospel of Ramakrishna, I found Sri Ramakrishna is saying that how does, in the final, final analysis, how does one realize that one is Satchidan and the existence consciousness place? It cannot be done really through the mind. So the consciousness, as it were, realizes itself as pure consciousness. In the Mandukya Karika also, in the third chapter, there is a section where this topic comes up, where it is said that that the mind ceases. The mind can only work with reference to these three. With the waking world and the dream world and the deep sleep world. The mind can only work with reference to these three. When these three are not there, the mind has nothing to work with. So the mind it gives an example. Like uh, Shankaracharya gives an example. Like a fire without any fuel. It ceases to burn. Fire without any fuel ceases to burn. In the same way, the mind becomes still because there is nothing specific for it to think about. In that case, the question is, then who realizes that I am pure consciousness, the Thuriyam? And the answer is, consciousness itself realizes itself. That is, the, that is the condition of the mind, that pure consciousness alone shines in the mind. That is the state. So that is what is meant here. Samvishati Atmanatmanam. One, as it were, merges into consciousness by consciousness. I said as it were because there is really no merging. You are that. You realize yourself as that. Mm. So even the word merging can be misleading. I am merging into Brahman. I am merging into my real self. How can you merge into your real self? You are your real self. Real self. So as if you merge into pure consciousness. This is the meaning of the twelfth mantra. 
and that concludes the Upanishad. Now we shall see to explain this 12th mantra Gaudapada writes some beautiful karikas verses to conclude the first chapter. We shall see these verses 24 to 29. All of these verses are about the 12th mantra. And what is the 12th mantra? A meditation on silence. Why a meditation on silence? Because it's the fourth letter or fourth aspect of Om. And why should we meditate on the silence which is the fourth aspect of Om? Because it corres corresponds to the fourth aspect of the self. What is the fourth aspect of the self? Pure consciousness. Which is distinct from waking consciousness, dream consciousness and deep sleep consciousness. And yet it is the foundation of all three. Right? So that's why we are using Om, the silence beyond Om to meditate on pure consciousness. How do we do that? What is it like? Some beautiful verses are mentioned here, uh, composed by Gaudapada. 24 to 29. Let's take them up one by one. Omkaram Padasho Vidyat Omkaram Padasho Vidyat Pada matra na samshayaha, Pada matra na samshayaha, Onkaram pada sho gyatva, Onkaram pada sho gyatva, Nakinched a pichinta eat, Nakinched a pichinta eat. Beautiful verse. Contemplate on the Om, quarter by quarter. Why quarter? There are four quarters, right? So one, two, three, four. Contemplate on the Om, quarter by quarter, matching the quarters of the self. Contemplate on it. Contemplate on A as this you, the waking person and your entire waking experience. Contemplate next the next quarter, U, as your dream world and you, you in the dream itself. This one, the second quarter, match. Then contemplate M mm, as the end of Om, where it Om merges into M. Mm. You close your lips. Contemplate that as the deep silence and the stillness of deep sleep. Consider the remarkable experience of deep sleep because we, we think it's a blankness, we don't pay any attention to it. But if you look at it as an experience, it's, a, it's an experience Spaceless, timeless, objectless. You see, in our entire experience of the universe, our life is, is uh, like a stage. And the stage is time and space. And the characters are objects. So time and space and object is our life. Look at it here now. This is the space. The time is from 4 o'clock to 5.30. And the objects are all of this. This is our experience. But imagine an experience where there is no object. Not even you. And no, no time. And no space. You might say, how come? There, why are you saying that there is no time or space in deep sleep? And I, I sleep for, for a few hours. And, I, and the space is the bed I sleep in. No. Your experience, right? When you talk about deep sleep, dreaming, it is your own experience. How do you experience? You don't experience three hours or four hours passing. You don't experience that you are in the bed. Nothing. Even that I am an individual being sleeping, that is also not experienced. Right? So, deep sleep. That is, mm. And then contemplate the silence following Om as you, the pure consciousness. Pada matra na samshaya. With conviction, na samshaya. Without any, without any doubt, make this firm connection. The letters of Om are the four quarters of the experience. Whose experience? Your experience. What experience? All experience. Just think about it. All experience of anybody who has ever lived is within these. Omkaram pada shogyatva. Having known Om quarter by quarter, culminating in the silence, you as the witness of the silence, culminating in that, na kinchi da pichintayet. Do not think of anything else. 
it's an instruction for meditation remember do not think of anything else if any other thought comes into the mind it will either be a sock thought about something in the waking world or a thought about something you had experienced in dream or mental world or a blankness right it will either be a physical thing which you see or experience outside or a mental thing or nothing blank it comes within these three immediately merge it back into the pure consciousness the silence it corresponds to a u or m mm. bring it back to silence again stay there don't think of anything else thus you stabilize yourself in the witness consciousness which is the silence beyond a u m which is the consciousness shining upon waking dreaming and deep sleep so very beautiful in one one verse he has summarized this Hmm. then aren't you kind of objectifying that silence so no you are that silence the the silence this this silence is not just the this silence is an is an objective silence is the silence which is where there is no noise but what we are talking about is the subject the pure consciousness shining in that silence you have to bring it back to that no, so how does one do that ah, exactly so you again go through that if any thought comes up a u ma suppose you think about how warm it is here this warmth isn't it a physical sensation it belongs to a the waking world go through that om you know this waking world dream world deep sleep silence and the consciousness back again stay there any other thought comes up don't think but suppose it comes up it will come up of course we have untrained mind so it keeps coming up bubbling up it will either be something about the world outside or something about our internal worlds or just a blankness all three do not correspond to any reality the sil- then so they all merge back into silence and you are the witness of that silence yes could you oh, once again explain the difference between the third state and the fourth state very important question what is the difference between deep sleep and this silence deep sleep is one state what is the difference between m and silence m is still a sound silence is not a sound right physically you say om can you see the difference It's, it's it's a silence and it's it, the, and m mm is a sound the sound m mm has a beginning and an end it has a beginning and an end the silence has no beginning and end this silence similarly here deep sleep is a state right right now you're in the waking state you're not in deep sleep state so the deep sleep is a limited state it has a beginning and an end you go into deep sleep and you come out of it it's a distinct state quite different from the other two states but this consciousness here is different from the deep sleep it is the it is that which enables you to experience the blankness of deep sleep the world of dreams and the world of the waking it is this very consciousness now which is enabling you to hear see understand think feel in the waking state it's the very same consciousness which lights up your dreams it's the very same consciousness which gives you the experience of deep sleeping so this this consciousness is very different from the deep sleep as this silence is very different from mm. Mm. it's a sound it's not a sound it comes and goes it does not come and go here it's a particular state of the mind it's not a particular state it is the light behind all states yes this question will be taken up later also what is the difference between samadhi and deep sleep sushupti and samadhi later on it will come in the third chapter of mandukya karika 25 all these are re- very beautiful poetic verses 25 all of them are about this silence yunjita pranave chetaha Yunjita pranave chetaha pranavo brahma nirbhayam pranavo brahma nirbhayam 
प्रणवे निुक्त प्रणवे निुक्त न भय विद्य क्वचि न भय विद्य क्वचि युंजीत प्रणवे चेत फोकस ऑन प्रणव मीन्स ओम प्रणव इज द नेम ऑफ ओम प्रणव इज द वर्ड इट्स अ नेम फॉर मेनी बॉयज प्रणव सो प्रणव मीन्स ओम फोकस योर माइंड ऑन ओम युंजीत मीन्स कनेक्ट और योक योक योर माइंड टू ओम by chanting by thinking by meditating upon om basically he means meditate on om focus on om why pranavo brahma nirbhayam this om itself is brahman om is brahman in what sense in two senses om is brahman in two senses what are the two senses one is a u ma what does a stand for wake waking world and the waker in the waking world if you take the cosmic waker that's what a stands for what does u stand for the dreamer dreamer in the dream world if you take the cosmic mind hiranyagarbha and what does m stand for the deep sleep and the deep sleep darkness take the cosmic deep sleeper ishwara so if you take the cosmic waker cosmic mind and cosmic deep sleep virat hiranyagarbha ishwara then a u ma the sounds together taken together the om sound itself it stands for saguna brahman brahman with qualities brahman with attributes what is brahman with attributes at the physical level it is virat at the mental level it is hiranyagarbha at the causal level it is ishwara basically the sound om the word om stands for saguna brahman what's the approximate english word god so om stands for god and the silence behind beyond om stands for the attributeless brahman nirguna brahman so om stands for brahman saguna brahman god the god of religion whom you worship adore shiva kali durga our father in heaven allah jehovah whatever you call it the god of theistic religions the god of attributes omnipresent omniscient omnipotent loving just huh? the helper the one who listens to your prayers that is the a u m a and the silence beyond om it stands for pure consciousness which is the nirguna brahman attributeless brahman so when you are chanting om the first three quarters stand for saguna brahman and the silence the fourth quarter stands for nirguna brahman what are you what are you don't you don't have to be doubtful remember always keep keep your mind here i am the fourth the seventh mantra said sa atma that is the self you can see yeah, that's a self but what am i self means you good for the self but what, what about me self means me you yourself so you are turiyam you are that pure consciousness so at the level of waking dreaming and deep sleep you are an individual and there is a cosmic dimension you are tiny and this is huge right you are one individual here and look at this world if there is a consciousness associated with the entire universe that's what we will call god that's the virat so at the waking level dream level and deep sleep level the difference between jiva and saguna brahman god and the individual is clear we are never saying that the individual being you see yourself as i this person am god that's megalomania ought to be locked up yeah. but what you are saying is when you do not consider yourself to the waking body or the the dreaming mind or the causal body beyond beyond that the causality beyond that beyond all three you are that unchanging consciousness isness consciousness bliss that is also nirguna brahman there jiva and brahman individual and cosmic are not there even in your deep sleep you do not feel any difference between part and whole right so om pranavo brahma om is brahman and what are, what is that brahman here it nirbhayam beyond fear uh, the attributeless brahman nirguna brahman is said to be beyond fear beyond fear means where there is no duality there can be no fear where there is no second what will you be afraid of you are afraid of 
attracted to, fearful of, anxious about a second thing, a second person. But if all is one, where is, what is there to be fear? Who will be afraid of what? So, Nirguna Brahman, the, the silence, the consciousness corresponding to the silence, that is beyond fear. So, Brahman is said to be Pranavo Brahma Nirbhayam. Pranava is Om, that Om is equal to Brahman, and Brahman is equal to Nirbhayam. Om is Brahman, is, is fearlessness. In fact, enlightenment is equated to fearlessness. When Janaka, the emperor, attained enlightenment, his guru, Yagyavalkya told him, and Abhayam Vai Prapto Si Janaka, you have reached fearlessness. Brahman is fearlessness. There is no death there. Where is death? What dies? In the waking world, the body dies. The mind changes. The body and mind are continuously changing, subject to death, old age, decay, disease. But pure consciousness is, is a witness, is not affected by any of them. Nirbhayam, yes. Why Brahman, if Brahman created, or not created, if all of us are Brahman, yes. and everything is Brahman, why it, that to me in and of itself is a duality? How? Because it, it's, I mean, you're going to say it's an illusion, but we all exist, and Brahman has created us out of itself. Right. So if Brahman How creates... Create the duality? Ah, right. It's a very good question. In fact, you should come to the uh, talk, the no mind talk, which I'm going to give in, in the first week of June. But let me give you the, uh, the answer here. Your answer is coming up very soon. Let me ask you a question. Has the gold created a necklace? If you say... The gold has created a necklace. Is there a duality? Are there two things? Duality means two things at least. So are there two things? Gold and necklace? Why are you it saying depends, no? It depends on what context you are asking me. If you are asking me in terms of objects, I would say there is there's something called gold, there is something called necklace. Really? I think but, that there is gold in the necklace, I, I can say yes. Yes, the gold and necklace, true. But there is gold and necklace. Can you, can you give me the gold and keep your necklace? When you say there is something called, look at the language, something called gold, something called thing, called necklace. Is that true? If the necklace is made of gold, are there two things then? Can you count them? Here is one gold. Let me set it aside. Then can you get the second thing called necklace? The necklace is not a second thing, follow the language, the necklace is not a second thing apart from the constituent gold. Will you agree with me? No. Though it looks different. Why is the gold creating the necklace in the first place? That's, uh, that, that's, what, I'm that's, what, I'm that's what I'm saying. I'm in fact answering your question, you must follow me. That is the necklace a second thing apart from the gold? No. Literally speaking, a second thing. No. Think. Right? You just said no. So... Not to. No second means not to. So the gold is non-dual with respect to the necklace. Non-dual means there is no second thing. If there is no second thing, can we say the gold has created a necklace? You say, why has gold created a necklace? If you ask gold, gold says, I didn't nothing. <laughs> the necklace is not a second thing apart from the gold. What Now you might ask, you, you can push the question. Okay, so why is the uh, gold appearing as a necklace? Yes. Right? Absolutely. No, 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 she, she's right. This is the question. I'll, 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 I'll. Yes. And not only half of them are suffering and half having a great life. Half of them and those who are... No, no, it's a question you should ask this and understand it thoroughly. Uh, those who are having a great life will very soon be suffering and those who are suffering, but some of them might have a great life afterwards. There's no end to that. Now, why is this happening? Somerset mom asked this very question. He went to meet Raman Maharshi. And then he writes in an essay, Somerset mom, you know, the one who wrote um, Razor's Edge, Larry, the story of Larry. Um, it set off a lot of quest for spirituality in, in America. Uh, so... He writes, 
about um, the creation of the universe. Brahman projected this universe, or Brahman created within quotes, projected or through Maya or whatever. And he writes, I felt Brahman could have let well enough alone. <laughs> Why at all do it? Why not sit still? Her question. And the answer is it does sit still. Here, in deep sleep, it, you sit still. There's nothing, there's no creation. What you mean by sitting still is that there is no difference, no change, no, um, no manifestation, nothing. That is what you call, that's called deep sleep. In the, in the um, cosmic level, it is called cosmic dissolution, pralaya. And that's a state that the universe goes through. We all go through it every day. No difference. <coughs> Think about it. Having a great life or suffering. In deep sleep, does anybody suffer or does anybody have a great life? Nothing. So you go through that. Now your question will be, okay, why not remain sleeping all the time? <laughs> Think about it. We have asked this question earlier and answered it also. Um, why? Do, no, this is an old question. And this is the eternal question. Why does Turiya appear in all of these forms? And the answer finally, Gaudapada gave. Multiple answers I've given you. Many, many answers. Divine play, Leela. It's fun. That's why. Why, then if you ask, why I have fun? Why have fun? There's no further question. If a child is playing and you ask, why are you playing? It's because it's fun. After that, you don't ask any question because fun is an end in itself for us. So, that's one answer. You might say it's not convincing. It doesn't matter. It's an answer. And it was convincing for many people. In the Bhakti Shastras, that's the last answer you get. Karma, cause and effect. Because of a beginningless chain of causes and effects, this is what Turiya appears at this point. And causation will continue and give you different forms, names and forms. But at every point, it is Turiyam alone. Whatever the form of the jewel, it was a necklace earlier, melted down, made into a bracelet, melted down, made into a ring. Right now it's a ring. Next time it might be a tiara or a crown or something like that. But Advaita says, all the time, there is no harm because it is gold alone. If it only would rec recognize itself as gold alone. If only you would recognize yourself as Turiya. I recognize that the gold is the gold. Why is it gold not recognizing that the gold is gold and not do anything? No, but... I'm giving you the answers. One answer is, uh, is play. One answer is, is uh, causation, cause and effect. You have set into motion a cause. It will give an effect. Um, then another answer is um, uh, because we are going through this process to realize ourselves as the Turiya, we need to go through all these experiences. It's something convincing for some people. Another answer is Maya. That nothing has actually happened. Turiyam has not appeared in anything. It just looks like that. You see the difference is this. Something really happens. And you are in, in misery. Somebody treats you badly. Somebody insults you. That's one situation. That's one situation. Compare it with the situation where you suddenly wake up and sit on your bed and think. Realize, oh I was dreaming. Nobody insulted me. I alone. Uh, Divided myself into the insulter and insultee <laughs> in my dream. Now, does that make the situation better? It does. Because really there was no harm done at all. It was a dream. That is the answer given by Maya. That's one answer. I've already given you four. There's a fifth one, which Gaudapada himself gives. What is the fifth one? It's the, it's the very nature. The gold can be... In some form, it can be a gold bar, it can be a necklace, a ring. In fact, all ornaments are potentially there in the gold. Why not be an ornament? It's fun. Hmm? When you realize yourself as gold, when you are not harmed at all. See, who is not harmed? The enlightened person is not harmed at all. Because the enlightened person realizes, I am Satchidananda. Let whatever happen at the level of body and mind. Number one. The unenlightened person is also not harmed. Why? Though the everything seems to be horrible, disease and death and loss, but ultimately if this is true, is there any real disease or death or loss? No. 
because you are Satchidananda all the time. It's like saying, why are there these terrible disasters? Um, earthquakes uh, and King Kong coming and smashing the Empire State Building and, and uh, all of these things, terrible aliens landing and uh, conquering the world or killing all of us. You will say, what's your problem? It's fun. It's Hollywood. From the point of view of the movie screen, no harm. The new movie screen will say, what alien? What King Kong? What earthquake? I'm all right. The worst of earthquakes, aliens, King Kong has not uh, uh, touched me at all. Now you are that screen. You are that thurium. So the answer might be, you're asking why I at all appear as, a, as anything. Why not? It's, it's, uh, it's the infinite potential for everything in the universe is within you. You can appear as these things. This is the final answer given by Gaudapada. Yes. So Swami, given that you're giving us multiple answers. Yes. It is quite possible that we don't know the answer. True. That, no, if, if there are five answers, then it's hard to believe all five are right answers. If it appeals to you, then it's a good answer for you. If it doesn't appeal to you, then there is the possibility that some questions just we can't grasp or don't know the answer. That's the also... Fits, that, that's, the rest of it fits well, right? This yeah, yeah absolutely. That's quite right. possible. Note that what he is saying is interesting because note that this is, this, is, this is a question which we ask. A person who is enlightened never asks this question. Not one person who is enlightened who has actually realized God in whatever tradition. Uh, in, uh, in, the, in the tradition of Jnana or uh, in, 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 in the tradition of uh, um, Bhakti or whatever. None of them ever asked this question. So that means in knowledge this question is not there. Yeah. In knowledge there is, there, this question is not there. This question is there only in ignorance. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So Maharaj, uh, a monk in the Himalayas told you he is Brahman ki lap lap hai. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't tell me. It was actually, it actually published in, in, um, in Prabuddha Bharat. I'll, I'll come to you. It was published in Prabuddha Bharat. A monk who followed the um, philosophy of, of um, who followed the philosophy of uh, Ajatavada, that there is no creation. Then, how do you explain the world? That was the question asked to that monk. He said, "What world?" And then the questioner was asking him, "This, this thing. Don't you see it? Can't you see it? Hear it? Smell it? Touch it? Taste it? You know about it?" So, oh yeah, oh this, you mean this? Brahma ki This is Brahman shining forth. This is Brahman. Where is the thing that you are calling a world? Yes. Shamiji, I just figured Brahman, the context of Brahman, okay? I think even Shami Vivekananda, everybody says if we accept the birth circle, our karma is already design, everything is going according to mathematical equation, then why Brahman is not the mathematical absolute theorem? Because our all actions are, we don't see, but top self, Puriyanta counts everything. Every circle we are finding past action. We can see, but it is already designed. Then it is a mathematical problem. Equation, if you take the whole thing, is a design. Already the mathematical theorem is Brahman. Why not? She's asking why at all this? <laughs> if Brahman is Satchidananda, then why at all this? Yes. What if we look at it the other way around and say that Brahman is the existence and Brahman asks the question, well, why isn't there some imagination? Why isn't there this play? this, what we call the world. Diversity, plurality. Yes. Why isn't there fun? We are back to fun again, having fun. Yes. Yeah. So, so anyway, so these are the multiple explanations offered. You will see some appeal to some people. Some do not appeal to others. Some may be too subtle and not quite, you don't get traction on what they are trying to say. Some may be poetic. Some may be logical. The law of karma is like trying to answer it logically. Some may be metaphysical, 
Some are very epistemological, like the Maya theory is epistemological, that it's an error, it says. Um, some maybe, the ultimate thing is it's, that there is no need to ask this question. It's the very nature of Turiyam to appear in these ways. Yes. No, 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 I never mentioned that. You said something about the universe as like we have been separated from the universe, and that confused me somehow. This is what we have been discussing from the very beginning. Look, it says, the Upanishad says, look at yourself, the self, Atman. You experience yourself in four ways, in, in, three, in four ways it says, four aspects of the self. Three of them are these. You, ha you wake, like you are awake now, mm -hmm. and you have a universe, yeah. waking universe. So the waker and the waking universe. Mm -hmm. And you dream. Mm -hmm. In the dream you have a dream world. Mm -hmm. So the dreamer and your dream world. Mm -hmm. And you have a deep sleep experience. You fall asleep and blank. These are the three ways you experience yourself. Okay. Isn't it? Yeah. What Upanishad tells you is, these three are part of your experience. But what Upanishad is telling you is that you are actually a one consciousness which appears or is experienced in these three ways. That one unchanging consciousness is Turiyam. So what I said was Turiyam alone appears as the waker, you and your waking universe. As you the dreamer and your dream universe. As you the deep sleeper and the merged universe of deep sleep. What is the deep sleep universe basically? There's no universe there. Where did it go? The way Upanishad sees is it that your waking and dream universes are all there in deep sleep, but they are merged in darkness. You, they are not experienced separately. That's what we studied in the first quarter, second quarter, and third quarter of the self. Do you remember? All right, let me just go ahead a little bit. I'll come back to the questions again. Pranave nitya yuktasya na bhayam vidyate kvachit. The one who constantly focuses on pranava, on om, constantly focuses in what way? I am that witness consciousness, studium, which is signified by the silence at the end of om. That's how you focus. Na bhayam vidya te kvachit. That person will have no fear. No fear where? No fear in the waking world, dream world or deep sleep world. Nothing in the waking will phase you. Nothing in the deep sleep, no nightmare. Even if you experience the nightmares. Has no problem for you, and death or deep sleep also will have no terror for you. Because you know they are all you alone. You are not harmed the least by anything that happens in the waking, dreaming, or deep sleep. You means that turium, that consciousness corresponding to the silence. Not you, the waker. The waker can, has many terrors, the dreamer has many terrors, and the deep sleeper may not have any terror as such, but the seed of all terror is there. The latency, potency of all terror is there. But you, the pure consciousness, on whom these three play, you have absolutely no, no problem. You can happily exist in the waking state, in the dream state, or switch yourself off in the deep sleep state. All three states can come and go, you can be relaxed. The game of life, the drama of life, you will enjoy it. All of it. Somebody said, actually one Swami, I'll tell you in Hindi and translate, it's powerful application of this, how you can be fearless throughout life. It says, he said, Advait vevahar ko mitata nahi. Advaita, non-duality, does not wipe out. Vevahar is a term which means your transactional experience. Waking, dreaming, deep sleep. Does, especially your waking world. It does not wipe it out. Advait vevahar ko mitata nahi. Advait aapko vyavahar mein nirbad kar deta hai. Advait makes you limitless in transaction. It loses all meaning if I translate into English. What it means is, Advait makes you absolutely free, effortless, relaxed, fearless in day-to-day -day life. That's the meaning. Advait does not erase your experience of day-to-day -day life. You see, why this, this question arises at all is, Sometimes people think spirituality means I will not experience, somehow I will be rescued from the mess that is my life and it will all, 
either it's it's going to become perfect if it's going to become perfect that's called heaven swarga the heaven concept that's what's that's what that is the concept of heaven it's going to become very nice it can become very nice but that also is strictly limited it will again as the buddha said all compounded things decay work out your salvation with diligence so even heaven that perfection which you put together that will also decay and collapse one day so that will not work another way is people think in deep samadhi i will not experience the world i will not experience the body and its problems i will not experience the world and its problems i will sit still in samadhi that is wiping out your transactional experience that's wiping out day to day life but advaita is not that 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 master said advaita makes you fearless relaxed and happy in the midst of transactions in the midst of day to day behavior you can go shopping you can uh, go work you can uh, be in a relationship you can uh, transact with the world do your very presence will be a blessing to everybody you have no problems with anything and anybody in the world any situation in the world so that's what advaita does yes Right. You said in silence when we do this om mm-hmm. we reach a peaceful blank. Yes. How do we know we reach the next step? Mm-hmm. I mean we seem to be wallowing in that blankness. No that blankness if you reach a blankness mm-hmm. if it's a peaceful blankness mm-hmm. from there just the turn is necessary to the consciousness which shines upon that peaceful blankness once you grasp that consciousness you will see it is the consciousness which shines in and through all these three so can it be so easy as that it can be <laughs> but practically it may probably it is not because we are not getting to it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> correct so does it erase the world from you does it erase your life very peaceful world gone universe gone life gone no advaita doesn't do that advaita actually doesn't change anything in the world the world remains the world appearance it remains as it is but you realize that and you are that one existence consciousness bliss, <coughs> bliss which you really are so you have no problem with it you have absolutely no problem with anything anyone anywhere it's it's a great peace it's a tremendous breakthrough it's like a enormous load off your shoulders forever and ever but if you find the load interesting you know fun then don't be in a hurry for enlightenment <laughs> take take your time so Suff- you know misery suffering struggle anger hatred ups and downs uh, heaven and hell uh, go through that wait uh, let me just go a little further now <coughs> pranave nitya yuktasya one who is constantly focused on pranava connected to the pranava connected means to that i am that silence consciousness that person has no fear anywhere at any time the whole universe may collapse no problem absolutely no problem So what do you mean no problem because nothing really has collapsed if from the point of view of the gold if the gold is melted the necklace is melted and coined into a uh, a bracelet gold is the gold if the wa- water you know the wave crashes into the shore into spray from the water's point of view nothing has changed i'm still water i was water in the form of a rushing wave now i'm water as, as millions of drops of spray yeah, no problem at all from the waves point of view terrible problem i am dead i hit the shore and i'm gone smashed into a thousand pieces <coughs> all right 25 26 another beautiful verse pranavo hy param brahma pranavo hy param brahma pranavascha parasmritah प्रणवश्च परस्मृत अपूर्वनो बाह्यो अपूर्वनो बाह्यो 
ಅನಾಪರ ಪ್ರಣವೋ ವ್ಯಯ ಅನಾಪರ ಪ್ರಣವೋ ವ್ಯಯ ಓಂ ಪ್ರಣವ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ಓಂ ಓಂ ಈಸ್ ಶ್ಯೂರ್ಲಿ ಸಗುಣ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮನ್ ಓಂ ಈಸ್ ಶ್ಯೂರ್ಲಿ ನಿರ್ಗುಣ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮನ್ ವಿದೌಟ್ ಪ್ರಾಯರ್ ವಿದೌಟ್ ಕಾನ್ಸಿಕ್ವೆನ್ಸ್ ವಿದೌಟ್ ಕಾಸ್ ವಿದೌಟ್ ಕಾನ್ಸಿಕ್ವೆನ್ಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಇನ್ ಸೈಡ್ ಅಂಡ್ ನಾಟ್ ಔಟ್ ಸೈಡ್ ಅನ್ಚೇಂಜಬಲ್ ಇಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ಓಂ ವೆರಿ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ what remember what it refers to the turiyam the silence consciousness that is the meaning of pranavaya the consciousness silence consciousness beyond a u and ma but the whole om the a u m and the silence after that it represents first of all it represents saguna brahman god what is pranava it is god it is the name of god a u ma is the name of god what is god in vedanta you see these concepts are so simple but crystal clear and so powerfully defined so tremendous clarity i find it nowhere else in the sacred literatures theologies of the world try to find out what exactly is god you will end up with mysterious words and theological theories and speculations nothing here it's very very clear what do you mean by god in vedanta it means om what does om stand for the a stands for the entire physical universe and consciousness associated with that the name given to that is virat that's what arjuna experienced in the 11th chapter of the gita u stands for the entire subtle universe all our minds the cosmic mind put together consciousness associated with cosmic mind just as you inside yourself you feel one mind if you imagine consciousness associated with all minds that is hiranyagarbha the cos- the subtle aspect of god and in deep sleep where everything is merged into a potential form consciousness associated with that potential form imagine the entire universe merged into a potential form consciousness associated with that the causal aspect of god so god has a causal aspect a subtle aspect a physical aspect all three they refer to one god not three gods all three refer to one god saguna brahman so in hinduism it can be given different names and forms shiva or vishnu or durga or kali or ganesha many in any form in any name it all refers to saguna brahman om is the name of that saguna brahman but that's not real just as not real means that's not the ultimate reality here we are talking about something beyond god that one consciousness where you and god are one you the individual and god the cosmic are one reality that pure consciousness turiyam that is also om how is that om the silence beyond the three is that pure consciousness so om as the silence consciousness represents nirguna brahman om as the sound a u m represents saguna brahman that is the idea of the ultimate reality nirguna brahman is the absolute in english you might, if you want to use the words Saguna Brahman is God and Nirguna Brahman is the absolute. That is Om. Om Pranavo Hyaparam Brahma. Om is the relative Brahman. Pranavascha Parasmita. Om is also the transcendent or supreme Brahman. Then Apurva an, uh, Anaparaha. Okay. Om is neither a cause that means the, the the nirguna brahman is neither a cause nor an effect do you remember we had done the karikas that um, effect the waker and the dreamer are effects and the deep sleeper is the cause do you remember we called it this the seed and this is the sprout bijankura we called it what else did we call it we 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 called it the um the the, the cause is this one Uh, pragya and the dreamer and the waker are the effect uh, cause and effect uh, we called it the uh, the causal subtle and gross we called it the um, we called it deep sleep and dreaming sleep and dreaming right deep sleeper is asleep and dreamer is dreaming waker is also dreaming so the physical world and the subtle world are the effect and the deep sleep world is the cause but om the pure consciousness is neither cause nor effect 
Om does not give rise to any universe. Here is the answer to your question. I was saying the answer will come. You are asking why does, uh, Nirguna, why does Brahman create all this? Which means you are asking why is Brahman a cause of all this? When you ask why, look at the language, why? Why means you are asking a cause. What is the cause? Brahman is the cause of all of this. Then you are asking why is Brahman the cause of all of this? And the answer is being given here, Apurva. Brahman is not the cause of anything. Anapara. Brahman is not an effect also. So, actually this Turiyam is not a waker, not a dreamer, not a deep sleeper. These are all appearances. Really it is this. It's like saying, gold is gold all throughout. It's never really a necklace, even when it appears as a necklace. There is no second thing called necklace. Go, is gold the cause of a thing called necklace? Answer is no. Gold is not the cause of a thing called necklace. Is gold the producer of something called a bracelet? No. Why not? Because show me the thing called bracelet. There is no thing called bracelet. There is no effect called bracelet. Apurva anapara. These two words mean that pure consciousness, turiyam, is not a cause, not an effect. You the pure consciousness, you are not the cause of this universe. You are also not an effect, a part of this universe. No. You are pure consciousness always. Again, anantara avai here. It's neither... Neither inside nor outside. Neither inside nor outside means, again, answer to your question. Very interesting. Let me ask you this question. The necklace, is it inside the gold or outside the gold? <coughs> Tell me. Why? Both? Hmm. Is it inside the gold? One may, way of saying would be, yeah, it's inside the gold because that's, go, that's the gold here and the necklace is there. But really, is there a thing called a necklace inside the gold? No. Like we are inside this room. There's water in the glass. So is there a necklace in the gold? No. no. Is it outside the gold? No. That, that is the right answer. There is no thing called necklace. What is necklace? It's a word. So, I use the word, there is no doubt, you cannot deny that there is a word called necklace. But where is the thing called necklace? I just use the word called necklace. But where is the thing called necklace? Whatever you can point to, whatever you can touch, is the gold and gold alone. You'll say, no, Swami, you're just playing with words. Look, that particular shape which you put here, that shape which you put here, that's a necklace, that's a bracelet. But is the shape a thing? It's a, is the form any kind of reality? Because apart from gold, does it have any existence? No. No. You say, no, there is a form called a bracelet or a necklace. Then I say, give me the form, take the gold. You can't. The form has no existence apart from the gold. So, answer to your question. The world, you say, why does Brahman produce this world? Why couldn't it sit, sit silent? Your question was that. My answer is, Show me the world and I will give you the answer. Where is the world? Is it outside? Did it produce? Little world stepped out of Brahman? I have been produced now. No, it can't. The moment it steps out of Brahman, it will disappear. Is there a world inside Brahman? Like a little baby kangaroo inside its mother, sitting in the mother's pouch? No. There is no reality called the world which can be inside or outside Brahman. If you understand what Brahman is, then you cannot think of a separate reality called the world. Neither inside, na antaro na bahya. Neither inside nor outside pranava, om, that silence consciousness. Is there any world about which you are asking? You might say, show me all the logic you want Swami. But I have the feeling that there is a world, it requires an explanation. The only answer is, awaken from it. Uh, awaken into your Turiya nature. Uh, instead of trying to answer that question, he says, focus on Om, the silence beyond Om. From that point of view, when you look back upon your question, the answer will be obvious. Let me finish. And hence, because Turiyam, the pure consciousness, the silence consciousness represented by Om, 
is neither a cause nor an effect. It has neither produced a world inside it or outside it. Hence, it is unchangeable. There is no change. All change is in, in these three. There is no change. Abhyaya, indestructible, changeless is this thurium. Pranavo Abhyaya, O means unchanging. 27. Sarvasya Pranavo Hyadi Sarvasya Pranavo Hyadi Madhyamantas Tathevacha Madhyamantas Tathevacha Evam hi Pranavam Jatva Evam hi Pranavam Jatva Vyashnute Tadanantaram Vyashnute Tadanantaram of everything in the universe, whatever you experience in your life, all of this universe, the gross and the subtle universe, pranava, om, is the beginning of everything, is the middle of everything, is the end of everything. Beginning, middle or end, in what sense? In specially, temporary. Temporary means, temporarily means in time, in space and in time. Look at the necklace if it's strung out in front of you in Tiffany's or something at the beginning of the necklace at this end it's gold in the middle it's gold and at the end of the necklace also it's gold at the beginning middle and end it's gold throughout look at your experience every bit of your experience in the waking in the dream and in deep sleep all of it is pervaded by one consciousness awareness alone in awareness you are awake, in awareness you dream, in awareness you sleep. Beginning, middle and end is awareness. Again take the gold, in, t in temporarily, in time, in time. This was in space, beginning, middle and end. In time, when the necklace was first put there, you know, came out of the shop of the jewellers. At the beginning, to begin with it was gold. When it was sold and used and gifted and all, it was gold. And when finally, before being melted down you know, into some other form, it is still gold. So at birth, in between and at death, you are still that thurium. Beginning, middle and end in time, beginning, middle and end in space, it is Om alone. Om is the beginning, middle and end of everything, spatially and time-wise. Then... Evam hi pranavam gyatva. In this way, when you realize pranava, when you realize the pranava in this way, what happens? Vyashnute tadanantaram. You become identified with it instantaneously. When you realize Om alone is everything, in time and in space, Vyashnute tadanantaram. You become identified. Vyashnute means merge. You become identified with it. I am that. When, how long does it take? The moment you realize this, not slowly. Now I'm 50% Om and 50% not Om. <laughs> slowly becoming more and more Om like. <laughs> Omi. <laughs> Earlier I was Omless. Now, I'm, <laughs> I, now I have an Om. <laughs> no. You instantaneously, tadanantaram, instantaneously, you are Om, that, that silence beyond Om. The moment you know this, realize it, that's all. Then 28. Pranavam Heshwaram Vidyat, Pranavam Heshwaram Vidyat, Sarvasya Hridi Samstitam, Sarvasya Hridi Samstitam, Sarva Vyapina Mankaram Sarva Vyapina Mankaram Matva Dhiro Nashochati Matva Dhiro Nashochati The God of religion, Ishwara, that is, it mentions that again specifically. What about God we, which we worship in religion, in Hinduism or in Islam or in Christianity, Judaism, that is also Om. He specifically mentions that. Pranavam hi Ishwaram Vidyat. No Pranava alone to be. A Uma, this part of it. To be the God of religion. Sarvasya Hridi Sangstitam. 
That God of religion, you see, it, it, in the hearts of everybody, immanent in the hearts of everybody. The, everybody here means every individual being, like us right here. Quite apart from all the Vedantic thinking, right here, we are individual beings. God is in our heart. That God is also Om. In the Yoga Sutras, you get this. Tasya Vachaka Pranava. Pranava, Om is the name of God. There, what God is, is, is being talked about? Not the Absolute, not pure consciousness, not Turiyam. There is talking about the God of religion. So, that's why Om is used in all Hindu mantras. In all worship, the Om is used there. Because it's the name of God. Any deity you worship, the name of that deity is Om. Shiva, Vishnu, that comes later. But first, Om. Sarva Vyapinam Omkaram. Om pervades everything. Matva Dhiro Nashochati. Meditating thus, meditating thus on Omkara, Dhira. The word used is very interesting. Dhira, literally in the sense, in uh, Indian languages, Dhira means a patient one, one with spiritual fortitude. Dhir, you say, in Bengali, Hindi. So one who uh, is patient, who is. Uh, um, who can hold on, persist to the end. There is a beautiful saying, like a, uh, as an American would say, a big shot is a little shot who keeps shooting. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, dhira means a person who holds on to this truth. We understand. And then we get, get, go out and look, okay, there are other things to do. Who is going to spend time sitting and doing Om? Dhira who, is, who holds on. Holds on to what? This understanding. Hold on to this understanding. Stabilize yourself in it. Try to live life in it in the light of that. So Dhira, it requires patience. It requires fortitude, um, focus, determination. Sticking to it. Meditating thus the Dhira, na shochati, goes beyond sorrow. The knower of Brahman goes beyond sorrow. The whole point of this exercise was transcendence of sorrow and attainment of bliss. The one who knows this, one who gets established in it. First know it and then get established in it. Sorrow cannot touch you. You see, it is... I was listening to a discussion, a panel discussion on Buddhism on YouTube. Uh, it was somewhere, I think in New York or somewhere. And the persons who were discussing, they were either scholars or practitioners of Buddhism. But the, the first speaker was an American person. So clearly from a Jewish or Christian background. And now a practicing Buddhist. He made a statement which made me smile. He said, you're talking about Buddhism. He said, is Buddhism a religion? That was the question. And he said, look, uh, Buddhism... Some describe Buddhism as a non-theistic religion, but I really don't know what that means. You know, it's uh, an oxymoron to me. Now, it's those who are coming from a Semitic religious background, Abrahamic religion, um, Islam or Judaism or Christianity, where the idea of God and religion are almost synonymous. You cannot have a religion without God. So, when you introduce something like Buddhism, it's very strange. How can you call it? It's like the heart of religion has been taken out. Religion is organized around God. Whatever you call it in different sects. But God must be there. How can you have religion without God? So, so to that person who is actually a Buddhist, who is a practicing Buddhist, but he finds it difficult to conceive of a non-theistic religion. Whereas if you come from a Hindu background, you can have a theistic religion, you can have a non-theistic religion. Um, the, the Sankhya philosophy, for example, does not talk about any kind of God. Hindus have lived for more than 2500 years with Jains and Buddhists who do not talk about any kind of God. And we, yet we consider them to be pretty religious. I have seen Hindu mandits in this country, uh, Hindu temples, with, uh, including a shrine for Mahavira. The, the, yeah, there are a number of Hindu temples where the Jains also go and worship. If you think about it, that's very strange. If you think about it in a theistic, Abrahamic religion context. Here you have a religion which is about God. Shiva, Vishnu, Kali, whatever you call it. Very, very God-oriented kind of worship which Hindus do. 
and parallelly here are these people the Jains who are coming in who are absolutely have nothing to do with God at all and both of them are worshipping in the same temple it's not a problem from an Indian perspective you know that religion can be theistic religion can be non-theistic so Buddhism is a non-theistic religion makes perfect sense from uh, from a Hindu perspective anyway that's just by the way so but here it says the god of theism is also Om Om is also the god of theism 29th verse, last one. Let's conclude. Amatro nanta matrascha, Amatro nanta matrascha, Dvaita syopa shama shivaha, Dvaita syopa shama shivaha, Onkaro vidito yena, Onkaro vidito yena. Samunir neta rojanaha, Samunir neta rojanaha, Amatra. Amatra means the silence. Ananta matra, the limitless silence. Look, why limitless? Somebody asked a question, what's the difference between this last one, m, and the silence? The m is limited, it has a beginning and an end. The a is limited, it has a beginning and an end. When you pronounce it, it begins and ends. U is limited. It is a beginning and an end. But silence is unlimited. Mm. It is there in the background when you are chanting Om. And when you finish Om, it is still there. Silence has no beginning or end. So silence is Ananta Matra. And that's why it's a perfect representative of the limitless consciousness. The waking, limited. Dreaming, limited. Deep sleep, limited. But the consciousness in which all of these three appear and disappear, that is unlimited consciousness. Ananta matrasya. And what is this Om? Dvaita Syopashama Shivaha. Direct reference to the seventh mantra. It is the cessation of all duality. The silence beyond Om is the cessation of all duality. Why is it the cessation of all duality? Because all names, A, U, Ma, merge into the silence. Why do they merge into the silence? Remember, because they do not represent any object anymore. All objects are nothing other than pure consciousness. Just as the words necklace, bracelet and ring, they, are, they disappear because they have no object to refer to. Because all the things they refer to are now found to be gold alone. In the same way, silence is Dvaita Syopashama, is the cessation of duality. Uh, just as the universe disappears as nothing other than pure consciousness, similarly the silence is the, where all the sounds disappear. Shivaha, it is the most auspicious, beyond suffering. Omkaro Vudita Yena, the one who knows Om in this way, who has realized Om. Realized Om means realized that I am this Turiyam, I am existence, consciousness, bliss. Sa muni naitaro janaha. Muni means mananat muni. In the word muni in Sanskrit means a sage. A sage. The one who realizes this, that one is a sage. Naitaro jana, not others. Not the ones who give lectures about Om. <laughs> not them, not who, those who write books about Om. Uh, not the ones who have long beards and sit in, you know, like we, we, have, we used to have comic books when we were kids. All the sages would sit under a tree and have long beards. And, and so, na itarojana, not others who talk about it. The commentator says, not other people who may be learned in the scriptures, but the one who has realized, I am Om. I am that silence consciousness. So, I'll take one or two questions. One or two, yes. If it's an object, what is it? We here remember, Advaita Vedanta is firmly rooted in reality. What is the reality of that? The reality can only be the substance. For example, let's say justice or gender, gender equality. Those yeah. are like abstract concepts. Right. We can't show it as separate things. Separately no. Can the name and form can't be similar kind of a thing. Yeah, they, the, look at the language you used. You cannot show it as separate things. 
can you show gender or justice as something separate from awareness don't they arise in somebody's awareness somewhere can they exist without awareness no nowhere no none of this can exist a number the concept of 1 2 3 4 numbers they also they everything every abstract concept ultimately depends upon consciousness itself yeah in that sense advaita does not deny advaita has no problem with um with uh, gender justice uh, with religion with theism atheism christianity buddhism uh, islam no problem gaurapada will say those the chapters which will follow now are very fascinating in one place gaurapada will say the dualists put forth differing explanations and quarrel among each other tair ayam na viruddhyate this teaching which we have just given has no conflict with any teaching whatsoever it is rather the basis of all the teachings everything in the universe depends on this it has no does gold have any quarrel with any ornament no all ornaments depend on gold and gold gives existence lends existence to all ornaments one ornament has a quarrel with another ornament that same gold can either be a necklace or be a bangle you can't have both at the same time it can't be a necklace bangle it can't be two they they look different the names are different the uses are different but both are nothing but gold and both are given existence by gold they cannot have any quarrel with gold in the same way this existence consciousness pristuriam this is the support of everything the good and the bad the beautiful and the ugly the 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 learned and the ignorant um the heights of um, subtlety and the grossness everything depends first this and then everything else vivekananda puts it this way it is that existence first then we color it with good or bad you are that existence all right one more question yes so when you talk about pure consciousness yeah why is there pure consciousness i understand that you have different experiences in that huh. and the reasoning that you gave for why why is it pure consciousness why is it pure consciousness what do you mean by pure consciousness here by pure you understand i do not mean something like pure thoughts and impure thoughts you know bad thoughts and good thoughts i'm thinking about krishna that's a good thought and i'm thinking about making money that's a bad thought i'm being greedy or something no not in that sense pure consciousness means contentless consciousness consciousness without any object why is this turiyam called pure consciousness because all objects are imagined in it they appear in it they have no existence ap- ap- uh, uh, apart from it but the pure consciousness itself has an existence right it is existence it is the only thing that has existence but why is it existence then why is it just nothing at all ah why you are asking a question why Um why is there nothing at all but you know what is more fundamental then i will let, let me uh, ask this question let me put this question in a most abstract form he's asking why is there something rather than nothing are you asking this in, in a way yeah. yeah so here we have gone come to pure isness pure awareness and in which everything else in the universe they are appearing and disappearing they have no independent existence so ultimately the question reduces to why at all this also why not nothing yeah. in fact there was a book writ- written recently very interesting book by jim holt yeah. uh, why is there a universe yeah. oh, 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 oh why does why does exist. why does the world exist yeah. why does the world exist so he asked this question you should read it he asked this question and he goes around asking this question to philosophers to people from theologians people from religion to mathematicians um to uh, poets uh, so you know top people in different uh, fields and he gets very interesting answers why is there anything rather than nothing let me give you an answer from another point of view from an indian philosophy point of view what is fundamental existence or non existence fundamental means what what does one depend on if something depends on something else then it's not fundamental non existence does it depend on existence yes. if i can sh- yes an absence depends upon presence 
<coughs> when you say when you say it is not there follow this when you say it is not there you are have to say then what is not there <coughs> so it's it's like this in nyaya philosophy this has been analyzed in nyaya philosophy one of the categories of things in the world padartha they call it padartha things in the world one of the categories is nothing absence so it, it in sanskrit the word is abhava absence and would you believe it they have they have spent more than a thousand years thinking of nothing <laughs> literally more than a thousand years and i spent um, three courses uh, one of the courses was for 15 days 5 hours a day thinking about nothing <laughs> the whole subject was nothing i mean yeah the abhava we studied and, and you will see i mean if you um if you google it on the google you will not find it it's it's very very subtle uh, very sophisticated dialectics philosophical arguments about nothing so <laughs> uh it's um, there have been great nayayikas logicians gangesha they, who lived about a thousand years ago in what is now the present state of bihar in mithila so he started a new branch of logic by his masterpiece tattva chintamani um in that in fact the first person who translated a part of that part of it it's a really tough book he's still alive jain mahanti i'm going to meet him uh, two weeks since uh he he lives here somewhere uh so there is something called abhava vada um the the discussion or, or the um the doctrine of 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 nothing of absence so we studied that once anyhow the point was when you say some it's not there you have to say what is not there they say abhava is sapratiyogika in sanskrit sapratiyogika which means so if you translate those into english it becomes absolute <laughs> jibber jabber abhava sapratiyogika you know what the english translation will be absence has a counter positive what does that mean in put to put it in simple words when you speak about absence you have to say what is absent if you say not there is absent you say who's absent so the example they used was bhutale they will say who is absent and where is it absent so bhutale ghato nasti that was the sentence used for analysis for 75 hours we went to through an analysis of the sentence there is no pot on the table bhutale means surface basically there is no pot on the table now remember what are we talking about there absence nothing but then we have to say what is absent the pot is absent where is it absent it's not absent everywhere in the universe it's absent there on that particular table so then what is more important presence or absence presence is fundamental when that is denied you call it absence let me answer it in another way this is one one answer another way look at the language you used when you asked a question why is there nothing instead of something you use the term why which means you want an explanation what is an explanation cause right why is it wet out there because it rained why did it rain because of the clouds you're giving explanations why is there something you're asking what are you asking what is the cause of the presence of something that means even to ask a question you must accept causality there must be causation mm-hmm. right yeah. so if there is causation then the cause must exist for there to be the effect so something is there you say why then you are asking a cause of that nothing is there you are asking why then there must be a cause of nothing also even to ask for an explanation you must ac- accept something like causality a cause effect relationship even to ask for a uh, thing like that yeah so we could be say it's what you said it's isness 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 is to say there isn't anything hmm. is no fair statement it's a, there is nothing yes isness in, in every situation there is isness i was thinking of that also if you if you look at the l- l- language um an absolute vacuum is it there or not is there so isness is there and in fact this thuriyam it is called sat it just means isness in one sense 
it is no thing. It's not a thing in itself. But it is the existence of all things. The possibility of all things. Everything exists because of this. But it's not a thing. Just as all ornaments exist because of gold. But gold is not a particular ornament. Yeah. So, you can ask, I'm saying that you can ask why this ornament exists or that ornament exists. But you can't ask why gold exists. Because gold is the possibility of all ornaments. I mean, as far as gold is concerned, you can ask why it exists. It's a particular element. But here, it is isness itself. You can ask why this thing exists rather than that thing. Or why anything exists at all. But why existence itself exists, that you cannot ask. Without the question itself, then it does not exist. So these are different ways. You get into paradoxes when you come to at, that, at this level. Last, very last question. So we will use the meditation. True. Awareness of nothing is awareness of nothing is deep sleep. Awareness of nothing is deep sleep. That's what deep sleep is. You every day you experience it, but then awareness exists. Yes. Otherwise, you would not experience the nothing. So there is nothing cannot. There is no, there's nothing called nothing. Okay. Now we are getting into re really <laughs> rarefied stuff. We will stop there. <laughs> now. Uh, very beautifully, this uh, Mandukya Upanishad has been sung. It's a long thing, hours together. I don't know how many, three, four, five hours. So, but here we're going to go through five minutes of it. Uh, only the seventh mantra. So Jayant will play it for us. We'll sit quietly, relax and just listen to it. Remember the seventh mantra which tells you about Turiyam. Neither the dreamer, nor the sleeper, nor the... So especially remember, not the sleeper. <laughs> don't sleep. Not the waking... Uh, nor everything, nor nothing, uh, nor something in transaction, not the objects of the universe, and so on. The non-dual consciousness, that is what you are. Let's hear it. Sit quietly, relax. If you like, close your eyes.
Shanti, 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 Hari Yom Tat Sat, Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu. Next time, before proceeding to the second chapter, we will have a quick revision. We will see what we have got so far. We have finished the Mandukya Upanishad. We have finished the Karikas associated with the, uh, with the Upanishad itself. So, we have finished the first chapter of the Mandukya Karika. But remember the text has four chapters. So, before going on to the second chapter, we shall see what we have got so far. A revision. In Sanskrit, in philosophy, they have a beautiful term for revision. The way they describe it is so poetic. Singhavalokananyaya, which means in a deep forest, imagine in an Indian forest, a lion was striding along, pacing along majestically. And once in a while, the lion 
stops and looks back upon the path it has covered so far before proceeding further. So that lion stopping and looking back majestically, that is called Singhavalokan, the lion looking back. Revision. So that's a very poetic way of describing revision. So next class, the lion will look back. <laughs> will stop and look back.